Well, I want to say hello to everybody and uh, extend a warm welcome to everyone. This is the Young Friends iNaturalist Project, BioBlitz in the Flu Park. Uh, and I'd like to uh, give a special thank you to Margaret Picorni and Shirley Smith. They were two people that uh, their interest and perseverance really helped to make this event possible. So thank you very much. Uh, and it is, right now, it is my honor to in, introduce Arjun Gupta from the Young Friends. Uh, he has also been an enthusiastic steward and catalyst for this BioBlitz event from the beginning. Uh, and I'm supposed to tell you that we are recording this event as well uh, for people to enjoy uh, if they weren't able to make it tonight. So thank you. And over to you, Arjun. Thanks, Susan. I'm happy to be here on behalf of the Young Friends uh, on this soon-to-be stormy day. So um, I think you'll see over the next 30 to 40-ish minutes um, that a BioBlitz is going to be a great way for us to stay engaged with our parks. And then also, um, it's actually appropriate in these strangely distant times because you can use iNaturalist by yourself, but we're collectively or figuratively as a group contributing. So I'm um, really excited to have Dr. Colleen Hitchcock today. So Dr. Hitchcock is an associate professor of ecology at Brandeis. And I'm gonna read the rest because it's very cool and relevant to what she'll, she's gonna talk to us about with iNaturalist. Um, so one of her many expertises is community slash citizen science. Her current academic interests are the role of citizen science in ecological inquiry and conservation biology specifically the studies of biodiversity, conservation, and phenology. And she's interested in the power of the public in scientific research, which is super relevant to us, and the application of community slash citizen science research as a model for learning by students. So today we get to get the opportunity to, opportunity to be her students. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Hitchcock. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. And thank you guys for hosting me. I appreciate the opportunity to um, share some love of iNaturalist, which is going to be my main goal for today is to introduce everybody to the platform, um, kind of share what you might be able to get out of iNaturalist and what tools it might offer you as the individual and friends of the public garden as a group. Um, and then talk about the kind of byproduct of it all, which is the science that comes out of using this platform or tool. Um, for those who joined in the last few minutes, I did put a little message in the chat with a link to iNaturalist. If you don't already have an account and want to set one up as we're chatting, um, <clears throat> that would be awesome. The other, I'm going to drop another link into the chat right now. Um, and this one is the link to the Friends of the Public Garden uh, project on iNaturalist, which toward the end of our chat, um, I'm going to switch over and explore. So if you want to explore in parallel, um, on your own screen and kind of minimize the zoom um, you can go ahead and do that or you can kind of follow along with me as I switch over to the screens um, all right so with that I'm now gonna open up a screen share and get started it'll be a little clunky for half a second but then it should all be pretty again okay um, all right, so just confirming everybody can see my opening slide. We have a title slide, the Young Friends of the Public Garden iNaturalist Project. Yes. Uh, one, okay, awesome. A one month bio blitz in three parks. And so part of the idea that we're going to be talking about today is the concept of what a bio blitz is and um, how FOPG might launch this one month initiation into looking at some of the biodiversity in the park um, and seeing what we can learn together as a community. So if we think about what is biodiversity and how, what, when, and why to INAT. So one thing you'll see me do is I will um, refer to iNaturalist as INAT and encourage you to get out there and INAT that. The other thing I might do is abbreviate the term citizen science or community science and refer to it as SITSI. So if you hear me suddenly talking about SITSI, that's what I'm, I'm referring to. Um, the other thing also, just before we fully get going, if you have a question, I'll take some questions at the end. If you have a question and you're afraid you're going to forget that question, you can also put it into the chat and we can start with some of those questions in the chat 
um, toward the end as well. I know sometimes I have a hard time retaining the questions because I get distracted by the next cool topic that the person is talking about. So you can go ahead and use the chat if you would like to think about, to, to kind of prompt me to respond to some things toward the end. Um, and if at any point my cadence is too quick, just somebody pause me because I do tend to talk quickly and I know in the Zoom realm that that can also be somewhat problematic. All right, so the how, what, when, and why to INAT. And so my first answer to this is because biodiversity is everywhere all of the time and species are around us all of the time. And if we think about um, connecting with that, those species around us, wouldn't it be great to kind of always go out with that friend who is the expert naturalist who knows everything about all of the plants, all of the insects, all of the birds, all of the critters and plants that we're gonna interact with. And we, Sometimes can't go out, but if with that person, but if we, the next best thing is to maybe utilize um, a tool like iNaturalist. And so what we're looking at here is we're looking at what a typical observation looks like on iNaturalist. And so you can see there's a photo here and there's a beautiful monarch caterpillar in what now seems like a former life. I studied caterpillars before I fully switched over to being all about citizen science. Um, so sometimes I do come back to, to my caterpillars. Um, and when you look at iNaturalist, there's a couple of things that immediately become clear is that there's information about a species, there's a where a species is. So you can see over here, there's a very kind of Google map aspecty part of it, right? There's a little pin. It looks like we're, you know, traversing somewhere. Um, there's a who, so who made this observation, and there's some date information along with the species. And we're going to see that that's going to become important as we go along and how we can learn from that and what we need to know to put something into iNaturalist to learn about um, the biodiversity. And this um, individual was found on the Greenway, so the Rose Kennedy Greenway a couple of summers ago. Um, so, and I note here that any life stage is okay. So you can, you can identify just about any aspect of a creature or a plant and use that as information. Um, here's just to kind of demonstrate that it, the organism doesn't have to be alive. So this is an American woodcock that was found um, right coming out of the aquarium tea stop. Hitch KR is my husband, I'm Hitch KO. Um, so it can be evidence of a species, it can be dead, alive, it can be feathers, it can be nests, it can be tracks, it can be poop, it can be leaves, it can be just about anything and everything. Evidence of living creatures, it is all good. So that's another thing to kind of keep in mind. And so you can start to learn about the natural world by looking at the evidence of those species that you're interacting with. So what is this thing iNaturalist, right? So that's why I think you should do iNaturalist is because you can start to kind of really um, see the world around you in a different way. Um, but iNaturalist at its core, it's a platform and it's a social media platform. And the designers of iNaturalist, when they set up um, iNaturalist, they were a couple of master students out in California about um, 11 years ago at this point, and they were looking to create basically a Facebook for naturalists, right? So they wanted to create a space where naturalists could get together and talk about the natural world. And so they came up with this concept of iNaturalist. So on that platform or the way that you can interact with that platform, there's two ways. You can download the app and interact with iNaturalist via your phone, or you can interact with iNaturalist via um, a website on your desktop computer. So both allow you to interact with the community, to add observations, to you know, get going on it. Um, so I wanna just offer both of those just in case um, that becomes relevant for how you interact with it. I actually very rarely use the app when I'm iNatting um, and prefer to use the desktop. And then I use my phone as a digital camera versus um, trying to take photos within the app. And there's some reasons for that. And I'll, I'll highlight why that may or may not work. So when we think about what iNaturalist is, it's this social network of people sharing biodiversity information and they're helping each other learn about nature. So just like on Facebook or on Instagram or you know, pick your social media platform, you interact with real humans. The nice thing about iNaturalist is that unlike other platforms, 99.9% .9 of the time, the interactions that you have are fully positive. Um, you might occasionally encounter a grumpy uh, naturalist who, you know, is frustrated at the quality of your photo, but even those negative interactions pale in comparison to um, interactions on other platforms. 
The other thing about iNaturalist that's really cool is that it is a crowd-sourced species identification system or an organism occurrence recording tool. And so what I mean by that is that as these interactions on the platform are happening and people are sharing the species that they're seeing and they're creating their lists of, you know, their life lists of species that they're seeing either in a place or around the world, um, the byproduct of those efforts, if all of the pieces in an observation are present, and I'll define those pieces in a second, is that we get a piece of scientific data called species occurrence data. And species occurrence data is really interesting in that that's the data that scientists are interested in in understanding climate change, for example, and how species range shifts might be changing as a result of climate change. Or it might be information that um, state biologists, for example, are interested in in terms of an early warning detection system for a new invasive species um, in a particular location. So that species occurrence data, that byproduct of what you're doing is really valuable to scientists. And it's on the side, you don't have to worry that your observation isn't good enough or that it's not high quality because at its core, the primary goal of iNaturalist is to connect people to nature. So scientists who are using the data, they vet the data so that they're looking for high quality data to kind of look at some of those questions. If there's a potential invasive species, say, occurring, and we had this happen a few summers ago um, here in Massachusetts, there was a new species of milkweed beetle. Um, state biologists will go out to the areas where that iNaturalist observation is and try and collect that species. They won't just rely on that one observation with the photo is fuzzy or something else might be going on. So, you can engage in it with that understanding that the primary goal is to connect people to nature. The secondary goal is to generate this scientifically valuable biodiversity data from these personal encounters, but not every observation has to meet that secondary goal. And I think that's important for people to understand because sometimes people get nervous making their observations because well, what if it's not good enough? What if you can't do something with that data? When you think about what iNaturalist does for you as a user, it helps you keep track of species. So you can create a life list. If you're a lister, iNat's the place for you to be because you can go into your profile and you can instantly see what species you have been seeing. Um, it offers crowdsourced identification. So when you add an observation to iNaturalist, other people in the community are gonna help you and they'll identify if that caterpillar you saw was actually a monarch caterpillar or maybe it was a black swallowtail caterpillar. And so if you ID it as one thing, the community will talk to you and they'll help you figure out what it is. And they'll talk to you sometimes in a very straightforward way by just adding another ID to an observation or they might leave you some comments or questions about what you saw. Um, and one of the things I promote usually to my students is that it's a way to learn about nature, right? So particularly in higher ed, there's no place for that freshman zoology course anymore. There's no place for that freshman botany course. And as an ecologist, I want there to be a place for that. And so the, one of the things that I can do is I can have students engaging in iNaturalist as a companion to some of the theoretical topics that we're covering so they can actually learn about nature. Um, then all these byproducts are that you create this useful data, you become a citizen scientist or a community scientist, and you can run a bio blitz. And so I think we're going to hit that full spectrum of things as we go through today. Um, so in terms of processing, what happens is you, oh, it's both this website and app, right? Um, you record your observations, you share those on the platform with fellow naturalists, and then you chit chat about these findings. Um, the app is great for making observations if you're gonna make one or two, right? You go out, you have your phone, you take a picture within the app. But if anybody has tried the app, it's a little slow, it's a little clunky. If you're going for, you know, if you wanna make some tracks somewhere, using your phone as a digital camera and then later importing those images into the platform or even into the app can sometimes streamline things. I'm a mother of three, three tweens at this point. They don't wanna wait for me to INAT everything within the app, but they'll tolerate me stopping to take various pictures of insects or plants as we're hiking along and give me the 10 seconds versus the 30 seconds pause every time. So that's a little bit of you know, what you need to, what you should maybe be thinking about um, as you're going along. And sometimes the app is slow to focus, at least with my Android camera. So if I'm trying to take some, a picture of something that's moving, all of a sudden it becomes very blurry when I'm operating within the app, whereas my camera will operate a little bit quicker. 
Now, the cool thing about iNaturalist is that data is in iNaturalist, it stays in iNaturalist, but it also flows out and it flows out to these two open science platforms. It flows out to the Encyclopedia of Life and it flows out to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Um, I'm gonna focus on GBIF because this to me is the, um, well, I guess I should tell you what EOL is and then I'll talk about it. The images from INAT flow out to the Encyclopedia of Life. Encyclopedia of Life has a whole suite of education materials and resources, and it is a project of um, E.O. Wilson, and it's exactly as it sounds. It's a catalog that create, that's creating an encyclopedia of the world's biodiversity. GBIF is this research infrastructure that houses the species occurrence data. So as a conservation biologist, when I'm thinking about um, a particular scientific question, I might go to GBIF to look for species occurrence data to see how species are moving, and iNaturalist data is one of the data sets that feeds into GBIF, along with other citizen science platforms like eBird, um, iSpotteron, which is an international one, all sorts of other platforms, along with scientists will also deposit their private um, data into those repositories. So the cool thing is that by making an observation in your backyard, your observation can contribute to an understanding of the biodiversity in your backyard, but it also flows out to these international locations and can inform a question about biodiversity at the global scale. Um, okay, so what happens, sorry, um, I couldn't remember where the images were going to come in on the slide. When you make an observation in iNaturalist, um, there's two main ways that you get your data into iNaturalist. Most people use um, take a picture, and that's the evidence that goes along with their observation. You can also record sound um, and upload sound to iNaturalist. It will do it directly within the app. If you have an Android phone, you have to do some of your own creative processing if you have an iPhone um, to get a sound piece of data in. But it, it basically accepts those two types of data. The next step is that the community talks about the observation. And so when you first upload, so here you can see there's a photo of a common buckeye. The individual added this photo into um, iNaturalist. It went along with their location data. Um, and then what happens is the community talks about it. And so what you're seeing down here is some screenshots of some of those conversations where the first person, um, the owner of the Oh no, it's not the owner. So it was River Riversdale Elementary. Um, the first person comes in and they ID it to the genus level. They knew it was a buckeye. Um, the students in this elementary school might not have known it was a buckeye and they might have just labeled it a butterfly. So when you give this, the observation a name, you just name it to the level that you're comfortable with. You don't have to name it to the species level because the community will actually interact with that observation and hopefully get it to a species level ID. Once it gets to a species, which you can see down here with Nick Block. Nick Block is actually somebody who lives in Boston, which is funny because this is a Florida observation. Um, he's actually a faculty member down um, at Stonehill. Um, but once it gets to that species level, if once enough of the community agrees on what it is, it will actually get this thing called research grade. And research grade is when the data actually flows out of iNaturalist um, and you get this little green flag on it and it flows out to GBIF and those other repositories. So when you think about how do INAT, what you're gonna do is there's basically five steps. You're gonna document what you saw, what that evidence is, usually a photo is a great way to kind of get into iNaturalist. Um, your phone may or may not, with that photo, record the date and time of when you saw it. So you might have to add that when and when you saw it. Um, the, your evidence is gonna be the photo or the sound. You're also gonna include where you saw it. And again, your phone may or may not record that data depending on the phone settings that you have. If it doesn't record it, you can always drop a pin where you were. And you also share who you are. So every INAT observation has an owner behind it. So it's not an anonymous platform, but you can be, um, you can use an avatar. So you can, I am Hitchco on iNaturalist. It doesn't say Colleen Hitchcock. It does when you go deeper into my profile, but my little username is Hitchco and that's what appears when people are interacting with me. When you think about what makes a good observation, 
A good observation is where there's one species clearly identified in the photo so that it's centered on that or you crop the image to indicate that. It ideally is a wild organism and I'll come back to that in a second when dealing with um, places like public gardens um, and parks. The photo's clear and in focus. If you know it, you name it. If you don't know it, you get it as good as you can get it um, in terms of naming it something. And iNaturalist about two years ago released an AI um, where the app will actually, and the platform will help you ID things based on what has been seen nearby. It's basically like facial recognition for species. And the AI is pretty good in places like Boston where there's lots of observations. The AI is less reliable when you get to parts of the world where there haven't been as many accumulated observations over time. My advice with the AI is agree with the AI if that's what you were going to name the species already. If you didn't know what it was, I would give it a course level ID. So if I went out and I made an observation of a maple and I didn't know if it was a red maple or a silver maple or, or a sugar maple, I didn't know my maples, I wouldn't necessarily agree with the AI if it was telling me it was a red maple, but I would maybe back it up and agree with it at the genus level. And so the coarser your ID to start, the more likely the community will help you push it to the species level. And it's easier or it's quicker to push it to the species level when there's not a mistake versus fixing a, an ID that's too specific to start with. Um, what will you see? You never know what you will see. So these are all observations from the Rose Kennedy Greenway, um, lots of different insects, lots of different plants. And you'll see some of these started out as unknown. And it's okay, if you have no idea what it is, you can start it as unknown. It just might take it a while for the community to take an interest in it. Um, here's some images from campus. This is a student who saw a bald eagle. It's like a, you know, it's like a promotional shot, right? The bald eagle in the foreground says Brandeis in the background. So sometimes there's surprising observations. And what I wanted to show you on this one is when you look at this observation, you see here it says EN. Um, and EN is because it is still considered an endangered species. And so one of the things that iNaturalist does is it actually protects data. So while it's an open science repository, if we look over here on the map, that map is actually not even showing Waltham. Now, if you know where Brandeis is, you know that this observation is in Waltham because there's other clues in the photo. But the map here has obscured that data. And so it actually puts some protections around that. So if you are out looking for you know, orchids and you, you're eye adding some orchids, we don't want the community to go out and harvest those, you know, last wild flowers. And so iNaturalist knows that and it puts some protections around those sensitive species. And particularly in places where um, poaching is an issue, right, because this is a global platform, that's how they work on some of those protections. You never know what kind of surprising observations you'll get. This is a student, Ben. Ben was a really laid back guy. He said he just stood there and this girl came over to say hi. And so he pulled his phone out and he iNatted it. Um, so some of these observations or interactions can be really surprising as well. Um, and lots of them are fun and opportunities to talk about things. iNaturalist observations can also spur change. This is an observation by a student on campus. Um, and so you see here, this one has the CR red flag. And so it's not endangered, but it's on one of the threatened lists. And so Phoebe, when she made this observation and tagged it, what she then became interested in um, was that this bird was near a new, newly constructed building on campus. And so then the students kind of rallied and they started to organize and look for bird strike on campus buildings to hopefully get the university to make some changes. So you can use it all year long. You, it might spur change um, in terms of documenting species. Some of this of what's in it for you. Oh, I'm a little bit over, but hopefully I'm, I'm not too bad. I'm almost done. Um, what's in it for you is it helps you keep track of what you see. So this is actually my life list. So I told you I was Hitchco. And so if I go into my profile, I, I can just click on my list. I clicked on the plain view, which just kind of lists them out for you. But you can see here, I've seen a total of 470 taxa. It breaks it down into the different groups, right? And I apparently really need to work on my amphibians. I know more amphibians than that. I'm gonna to have to go out and push that number up a little bit. But it helps you keep track of the species you see anywhere, anytime. This is just my global life list. If I wanted to look for species I, I saw on campus, I can filter that data that way. So you can play with the data to get out of it what you wanna get out of it. It helps you learn about those local species. Um, it will help you connect with a community of naturalists. So both, oh, 
finished, forgot my parentheses there, but both of those members within the Friends of the Public Garden and beyond, you'll, once you get into iNaturalist, you'll start to see there's some local community members who are really active. And then the byproduct is going to be the science that is a result of your efforts. Um, how does using iNaturalist help the Friends of the Public Garden? Well, just even setting up our project yesterday for the Friends of the Public Garden, we already have the start of a species list. And so you can see that URL down here. I actually can't dump the URL right now into the chat. Oh, but I did that already at the start. So it should still be in the chat if you want to click on it. Um, but already, based on just defining our place where we want to look for observations, there are already 1,500 observations in the Commonwealth Mall, the Public Garden, um, and the Boston Common. And people have documented 257 species in these places. So now there's a start of a species list and not just a list of the plants, but a list of the insects and birds that those plants are hosting and part of the urban food web with. There is a special consideration, particularly when looking at gardens and parks. So if you remember way back, I don't know, 10 slides ago, I said, iNaturalist is really interested in wild organisms. Um, and so by wild, what we mean is things that aren't cared for by humans, that aren't captive and cultivated. So one of, that doesn't mean you can't put observations in that are captive and cultivated. What you need to do when you make those kinds of observations is you need to designate them that they are not wild. And the reason that iNaturalist isn't, this is the one caveat with iNaturalist, so iNaturalist wants you to, to designate those and that they don't include that in their primary goal is because the data is flowing out to these repositories. And so when thinking about climate change and how species are moving and range shift, scientists don't really care if a species is out of range if it's in a botanic garden, right? Because there's, there's a reason that it's in the botanic garden, but it's not a wild population that's self-supporting. Um, so there's a little designation here where it says organism is wild and so you can see here for this observation of the dawn redwood which is which was in I can't remember if it was in the garden or the common um, it has this tag of casual instead of research grade even though we're at species level and the reason that it has this casual grade is because it has been tagged as not being a wild organism. So when you're documenting plants, it's really valuable for friends of the public garden to have a sense of what species are there. So you can go ahead and document those captive cultivated. You just wanna make sure they're tagged and it's not indicated that they're wild because if they're wild, then it might confuse scientists when they're looking for data um, as to where they are um, and what's actually going on with them. Um, so our next steps are to start using iNaturalist anywhere, anytime. You can go ahead and join the Friends of the Public Garden project. You can get out this month and help make observations. So, um, Susanna and Arjun, I think, are going to put an end date on kind of the, the goal for when this month will end. But we thought maybe setting a goal of getting the project up to 25 observations and a total of 400 species might be something to kind of work toward if people could get out for an hour or two each week to document those species. Um, and then hopefully in the spring, um, if Susanna and Arjun don't invite me back, they'll at least share some information about the City Nature Challenge in 2021, which is a regional effort to document biodiversity every spring. Um, I've included some links and uh, Susanna and Arjun have access to the slides from today so they can share these links as well to kind of follow up and look at some more information. Um, and with that, I'm gonna stop screen sharing and open it up to questions. And I can also then start screen sharing again if we wanna go back and look at the project page. Um, Great, thank, thank you so much. This is what I do have a question. If you're not sure if it's, um, you know, a, a a cultivated tree in a park, should you err on the side of saying it's cultivated or should you err on the side of saying it's wild? So my tendency is to only delineate species as captive cultivated if I can clearly argue that they're captive cultivated. I do tend to give a little bit of leeway on that. Um, so the thing I tell my students is, if you see it in a mulch bed and it hasn't planted itself there, then you mark it captive cultivated. If it has a tree tag on it, you mark it captive <laughs> cultivated. If it's in a lawn that's clearly manicured and ma maintained in some way, 
you can market captive cultivated. And so those are the criteria, but there aren't universal criteria for declaring something captive cultivated. It's definitely more a feel. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Does anybody else have any questions they'd like to ask? Oh, really? <laughs> Uh, well, if we want to take another minute or two, I can go back and just, we can poke around the project a little and see what species are hanging out in there already. Does that, does that sound like a good time for all? I don't know. <laughs> it's funny because I can only see about five faces, so I can only read about five of you as to your reaction as to whether or not that's interesting. <laughs> let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. That sounds good. Okay. Um, oops, I didn't mean to show you my messy screen. Oh, you know what? I somehow closed. Hang on. So I'm just going to go to iNaturalist. Um, everybody's seeing my screen at this point, right? When you go to iNaturalist and you're logged in, it'll automatically take you to your dashboard and your dashboard will give you recent updates. It will show you your recent observations. It's going to think for me. Um, it will, you can sort by a calendar to look at what you've seen as of late, etc. I'm going to go up here to this, actually, I'm going to go over here to community and I'm going to click on the project tab. And then I'm just going to go over here to the search bar for projects and I'm going to put in friends of the public garden. And that will pull up the project and I'm going to click on that link and it brings you to the front page of the project. When you come to this front page, if you want to get updates from iNaturalist every time you log in. So when you when we saw my dashboard, it had these like updates in there. Um, the way that you get those updates is over here on the upper right hand corner. If you're logged in, it'll say join instead of members. And so you just go ahead and click that join button. And then when new observations appear in the project, you should get some notifications in your dashboard. I think it prompts you and asks you maybe a few questions when you join as to, you know, how, how bothered you want to be by um, iNaturalist. So once you're on this front page, there's a couple of things that you can do. You can just peruse the um, overview. And here you can see on the overview, it'll usually give you the last four to eight observations that were made in the project. When you look at those, you can see up here in the upper right hand corner of this observation, it says RG. RG means that that observation has a hit research grade. And I guess one thing I didn't fully define, which I'll define now, is that research grade data is data that has um, two thirds of the community agreeing on what it is at the species level. You can see um, you know, who's made the most observations. And so this is funny, this is Zoe Foster. She was an intern for our City Nature Challenge for a few years. And so I'm guessing that her observations come from um, April when she was out bio blitzing for the CNC. Um, who has the most species? Um, if you get on iNaturalist, I don't know M. Mull Queen personally, but he or she is very active and will help to identify a lot of your observations. Um, Jay Lehman is a, he might be a senior now, but he's a student at UMass Boston who's also really active. Um, and then you can see over here on the right hand side, hopefully though somebody from Friends of Public Garden will bump these people off of the top of this leaderboard in short <laughs> order. Um, you can see over here the most frequently seen species. And so, yep, those eastern gray squirrels are the top observation at the moment. Um, sometimes it's fun to go in and look at the observations and just compare and contrast among them. So I just clicked on um, those observations and you can look at it in a variety of forms. Here, oh, I, was, I wanted to see if you had white squirrel observations or not in your gray squirrels, and you do. So it looks like somebody's got one or two of those um, white squirrel um, observations, which are always fun to talk about in Boston. Um, but you can, there's all sorts of like secondary data that you can start to think about within iNaturalist. So you can look at coat color and how coat color varies in a single geographic location. And you can look at molting activity and when individuals are molting. And you can also get some sense of how habituated, right, individuals of a particular species might be in a particular location. Oh, look at that one. It's like a cameo over there. He's just posing for it. Um, oh, and there's another squirrel in your pants. Who knew that squirrel in your pants was really such a popular um, thing? I definitely didn't, and I'm not going to stand there for a photo with a squirrel in my pants <laughs> for sure. Um, but I think you get a sense of kind of some of the interactions that people will be having with various um, species. I want to go back. And there was a question. Sarah had, had a question uh, in the chat. Okay. 
Um, let's see if I can pull it up. Ah, um, so when something says needs ID, um, it usually means that it needs more members of the community to agree with what something is to the species level before it becomes research grade or it sometimes means that something might be classified coarsely. So there might be something with a genus level observation or a family level, I'm not observation, a genus level name or a family level name um, on the observation. And so that needs ID is, it's looking for community consensus. So it needs at least two people to agree with what it is at the species level before it will no longer need ID. Do you want me to unmute you, Sarah? Hang on. Yeah, I can do it. Oops. So do you have to do something to get people interested in your page to make them to get that? Is it, or, or is it some way of posting it that to attract attention? So at this point, iNaturalist is high traffic enough that individual pages don't necessarily need to promote themselves beyond those pages unless there's a particular community that they're targeting. So by that I mean, you know, promoting the project page to other members of the Friends of the Public Garden group so that other people who already know some of these species can help move the plants that you know exist in the garden or the common to a um, species level ID is a great way to kind of build community. Outside of that, you might find that people will join your project. So now one of the things is, right, if we look at this Eastern Gray Squirrel observation, let's see if it's caught up because this is a relatively new project, but um, okay, it hasn't yet. So this, we just created this project yesterday, but if you give this another day or two, INAT kind of resets itself. And what'll happen is this person, T. Kirk 304, if they check on this observation, will come down here to projects and what they'll see is that one of the projects listed under here will now be the Friends of the Public Garden. It just hasn't caught up with itself yet. And then if they're interested in joining the Friends of the Public Garden group, they can click on that project, join the project, follow along, et cetera. Um, so it'll eventually, it, it, you can gain some community that way. The best way to get the community interested in your observation is to start it with some course ID, so not leaving observations as unknown. And even, even a course level ID such as plant will get the people who are really into plants to start combing through that, those plant photos. So starting it with some course ID is the best way to kind of get it moving forward and into the hands of members of the community. We have another question here that says, what does some right, rights reserved mean for photos? Ah. That's a great question. So down here, um, when you upload your observations to iNaturalist with the photos, you have a choice of how you wanna license those photos. And so um, this one says, this user decided all rights reserved, which means I you know, can probably only download this photo to use in educational purposes for a slideshow, but otherwise this photo is copyrighted, right? So it gives the owners of those photos some protection about the use and reuse of those photos. Um, and so my recommendation, but I'm not a professional photographer, and so this is why I'm comfortable doing it, my recommendation is to give it the most open Creative Commons license because then there's the most scientific value. Um, because then scientists can access those photos in diverse ways and do manipulate those photos to gain secondary data. Now, this is just an Eastern Gray Squirrel, but there's projects that, for example, that are looking at um, molting patterns of mountain goats and how climate change is affecting the molt patterns on um, mountain goats. And what scientists have been able to do is batch download the photos from iNaturalist and then um, analyze it with software to see how much of the coat has molted and the dates to see how those dates are changing over time as a result of climate change. So sometimes there's secondary data in your photos that is useful. It's not just that species occurrence data. Okay. Hi, Mike. Uh, is, there, is, this, is there anything that happens if an invasive species is identified by a community member and verified by an expert? So nothing happens in iNaturalist directly until someone shares that information with people who can do something about it. 
Um, so there are, I know there are some active members, for example, there's active members that, there's active scientists at all sorts of levels involved in iNaturalist. Many professional scientists, though, participate in iNaturalist as kind of a, a side gig, right? Like it's a hobby, it's something they're interested in, they'll pull data from it, but they may or may not be actively, or it may or may not be part of their official duties to kind of look at iNaturalist data for invasive species. So that example I gave earlier about the, um, the milkweed um, bug, which it was a soldier bug that was seen. Um, what happened was it happened to be that there were two observations. One was in a student project I was running, one was in a student project another professor was running at UMass Boston. Um, and we both happened to see them at the same time. We sent it to one another. And then my colleague at UMass Boston actually sent it up the chain to one of his former students who worked for USDA. And that's how that alert happened. So it will happen, but it's in an informal way, um, but it's a way to gather data such that if somebody from Friends of the Public Garden, for example, saw all of a sudden that there were some observations um, of, you know, any of the state um, invasive bugs, perhaps, that we're monitoring, then sending those links to the appropriate person will also, they'll be able to see those photos and, and figure out, you know, if that's something they should act upon or not. I've lost the chat, but let me see if I can open it up again. Okay. Any other questions? I'll go back. I'll stop sharing so we can see everybody's face again. Or some people's faces. Yep. Okay. No questions? Awesome. Oh, is there value to adding older photos? There totally is value to adding older photos if you have all of those bits of information. And by bits of information, I mean the when, the where, and the photo. Um, so if you can get those other, if you know those other bits, then yes, adding those old photos is definitely of value scientifically. If you don't have those other bits, there still might be value in adding those old photos if you want to be able to add them to your own species list, right? So if you want to use iNaturalist as this tool for documenting the things that you've seen over um, a longer period of time and you have some cool images, but you don't remember exactly where or you don't remember exactly when and they're not digital, um, they're not digital in the modern sense of being digital with some of that metadata embedded in them, it still might be a value to you to add them to iNaturalist, but it may not be a value to the scientific community. So that's the important thing about iNaturalist is it's valuable to add whatever you wanna add to iNaturalist as long as you're not truly violating kind of the mission of iNaturalist, if that information is of value to you. Um, so training, so <laughs> training is optional. Um, I find, so I teach, for example, a large introductory conservation course in the spring that has a mix of students in it that are, some are majors and some aren't majors. And for some population, just like anything else, for some pop population of them, I can send them to the website and they're, you know, they're in in 30 seconds and they're out in the field and they're making observations and then they're emailing me 14 times a day to, you know, because they're so excited about iNaturalist. And then I have other students who, you know, will freeze at the site of the website um, and at the kind of what they see is like the gravity of making these observations and, and that it's too much science for them and they need training to kind of get going in it. So I really think it depends on your audience. Um, and, you know, enthusiastic naturalists will often take right to it. Um, and, and particularly photographers and, and, you know, digital natives will gravitate to it, but other people need a little handholding to get going for sure. And I just wanted to add, you know, the, the seems is so cool and it, you can just do this anywhere in the world. So any vacation you take, anywhere you go, obviously we have this project uh, for the Friends of the Public Garden, but you can be adding information to anybody's project anywhere. Um, e even if you don't know it exists, you can be adding information. So I think that makes it really, really fun. It, it totally is fun. And you can explore data from anywhere in the world. And so, you know, if, you know, my family hails from a small town in Ireland called Arklo. And so sometimes I might, you know, spy on the Arklo observations to kind of see like, what are the species um, 
in Arklo. And sometimes, you know, uh, I grew up in New Jersey, I'll peek in my hometown and be like, oh, I wonder what people are seeing in the Pine Barrens right now. And you can, you can explore those observations and you can add, you can help ID those observations. So engaging on iNaturalist, even if you can't get out to the, the garden um, or the common right now, you can go into this project and you can help move some of the observations that are sitting there not ID, you can help identify those and move those along. Um, there's actually somebody in Massachusetts right now, many of you might know of Tom French, who used to be this one of the state biologists. He just retired, I think about six months ago, um, from Mass Wildlife. And I don't think he's made a single observation on iNaturalist, but he has identified, I think it's something like 8,000 observations at this point. And so, um, his, his avatar is T French. And so anytime I see that T French has ID'd something for me, I'm like, oh, that's which intertidal snail it was. Cause I'll be, you know, stuck on something and I haven't gotten my gone back to get my field guide yet. And then I'm like, oh, if T French ID'd it at this, I'm like, we're good. And I agree with T French. And so that's the other fun thing that you'll start to see is that there's users, there's super users and super ideas. They, there's kind of different camps of people. Um, and so some people are those ideas and some people are those observers. Um, and you'll, you'll very quickly kind of see who the super ideas are because they'll, you'll see their names a lot in your feed and you're like, oh, there's, um, you know, there's T. French again, um, or there's E. Danko. E. Danko does a lot of flies. He's a former Brandeis student um, and he's, I think, the top curator right now globally for flies on iNaturalist. And so people really they do their thing and they get in there and all Evan does, Evan is Edenko, all Evan does is look at flies on iNaturalist. So, you know, you just tag it as a fly and you can be pretty confident that Evan's gonna be the one that helps ID it for you. Well, that's great. Um, last chance for questions? Anybody? Oh, yes. Did there, you Yep, I see it. So the question is, can you also put in comments as well as ID, such as the condition of a tree? So there are, there's, um, I just talked about the basic fields in iNaturalist, the kind of the where, the when, the what, um, but there are kind of, one, there are other fields along the right hand side of the screen where you can add additional data. Um, and so for example, for trees, you might be, you can add information like it's leafing or it's um, flowering or it's fruiting and you can just check a box that will also capture that bit of phenology data right that timing of those life cycles and there's in the comments you can also put in more free response kind of things like oh this tree looks like it was hit last week by lightning and is in poor condition um, note to self you know to contact the tree warden um, to indicate about the status of this tree and you can also tag other people so if you see something and you want Arjun to know that you saw this and maybe this is a species or an individual that he should go check out you can tag his username or name in the comment as well so that they'll then get a notification in their dashboard to go look at that observation. So there's lots of other things that can go into iNaturalist and the conversations that you have with other iNat users, um, particularly as a beginning user, you might see that there'll be people who will welcome you. You know, after you make your first handful of observations, you might get like a, hey, welcome to the community. Thanks so much for joining us on iNaturalist. And that just will be another volunteer on the platform. You might also get um, a message. There's a woman, um, Susan Hewitt, who is a mollusk expert, and I live up in Swampscott in the intertidal, but I do not know my mollusks. And uh, she often IDs my things for me. She's based out in New York City, and she'll probably ID a lot of your things. Um, but I think in the beginning when I was trying to differentiate surf clams and other types of bivalves, I think the comment I got from her like the first 15 times was, could you please take a picture of the hinge? the hinge is the actual important piece on a bivalve that you need to take a picture of for me to ID. And I was like, got it. The hinge is what I got to do. And just like with some plants, you know, having the petiole and having, you know, um, the phyllotaxy along the branch is going to be the key thing that you really want to look at in addition to an up close picture of the leaf and the serration and all of those other things. You'll see that some users will give you tips and tricks that if you want the community to talk to you, the higher quality your photo is and the more that people can use information in that photo to ID things, the more likely it'll move through to an observation level.
great. Oh, that's certainly a lot, a lot to take in. And it's wonderful that there's so many experts out there in these very obscure areas, to me anyways, obscure areas. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, okay. Well, I thank you. This is really wonderful. And uh, Arjun and I will get back to you with the, you know, we're, we're going to um, send a, resend the information about the challenge and meet up uh, when, when will the month uh, conclude and, uh, and hopefully everybody can rise to the challenge and get out there and uh, start taking pictures and adding things to the database. But this is this is wonderful, and we will invite you back, Colleen. Thank you so much. We really um, well definitely. If it's not me, I'll definitely get somebody to talk about the city nature challenge for sure. And I just put my yeah. email in the chat. Um, if anybody has questions, you can feel free to email me. Um, I might be a little slow in August responding because there's this whole thing, you know, global pandemic and online teaching that I have to kind of sort out. But once I get through that little hurdle, things will calm down. So just give me a little time if I don't respond right away. I'll do my best. 